Hey everybody, it's Doc. Welcome to the channel. So today, we're prepping to take the Bronco on a very long trip, 1,400 miles, uh, basically 700 miles each way, and I'm going to try and achieve a couple of things just for fun with this video. The first off is we're going to do a comparison between eco and normal mode, just to see if there truly is any difference. And then the other part of this is really to just get a feeling for the Bronco on, you know, on big road trips. And you know, one of the things that I found with the Bronco in the past 3,000 miles that I've put on it is basically this thing really reminds me of my FJ Cruiser. And that's a good thing when it comes to road manners. So we're going to test that out. We're going to see what idiosyncrasies this vehicle has, good and bad. And I think it'll be a lot of fun. First things first, we're going to switch from normal mode to eco mode. There we go. And the trip odometer should be reset. Basically the rules of this particular little game that I'm playing is we're going to do 700 miles in one direction on eco mode, 700 miles back in normal mode. We're going to try and hit the same gas stations and we're going to use the lowest cost fuel at each gas station because it doesn't really matter. And the only reason I'm doing that is because sometimes when you get to Missouri and Oklahoma, you're you're using non-ethanol fuel, where in Iowa, it's so heavily subsidized that we have ethanol fuel everywhere, which has a different energy um, than the other fuel. So with ethanol fuel, technically you'll get lower miles per gallon than you would if you were just running regular fuel without ethanol. So to keep things fair, we're just gonna go with the cheapest stuff that we run into, and we should have it even out in the end. Previous to this particular uh, trip, on my trip odometer, I, I run about a 60 mile loop every day, and I think I was running 17.6 miles per gallon. All right, I'm gonna be making observations during this trip just to let you guys know what's going on. And one of the more annoying features of the Bronco, I hate to start with something annoying right off the bat, but is the fact that in the cold weather, when I wash this truck, for three or four days later, or until the vehicle has been thoroughly thawed, you can hear that beep, I will get sensors going off randomly uh, as far as the parking sensors with the Lux package. So that's super annoying, but we'll move on to the next one here shortly. Something to mention, and you know, maybe a little bit of a disclaimer, it's not exactly the nicest March day in Iowa right now, and I'm bucking a pretty good headwind as I'm heading west to get on the interstate. And I'll be doing this for about an hour. This may or may not affect the mileage, but you know, maybe it'll all even out in the end anyways. One other thing I wanted to mention, you know, one of the primary complaints of the Bronco, uh, particularly at highway speeds, is the noise from the hardtop. And you know, quite honestly, Grant, I'm only doing about 60 miles an hour. This may change my opinion when I'm doing 75, but it's not awful. Uh, you know, it's certainly quieter than any previous Wrangler that I've ever had, but in the same respect, it's also a lot noisier than the, uh, the FJ Cruiser, but it didn't have a removable top anyways. So I'll be back with more observations. We'll just keep plugging away here. Something that makes this vehicle really a pleasure to drive is the adaptive cruise control. And I think it's only available in the Lux package and it comes with the lane keeping. Um, the lane keeping, while it's nice, especially if you're driving, you're a little bit tired, um, it'll kind of bump you back in your lane, but it's not lane centering. So unlike you know, a Tesla or a more expensive car, it's not going to place you in the middle of the lane and keep you there uh, and basically drive the car for you. It's good, just going to play bumper cars to put you back in your lane. But again, overall, love the adaptive cruise. If a car is slowing down in front of me, they're, gonna, they're going to churn. It will actually bring the vehicle all the way to a complete stop. Uh, there is a point where it kind of seems like it'll kick out, uh, but most of the time I'm, I'm kicking it out before that because I'm more attentive at that point. So again, 
great feature of the vehicle. It, you know, I know it's you have to wait to get a Lutz package probably, and it, it's a big holdup. But I'm glad I waited. I really enjoy this feature of the Bronco. So I mentioned that today is not the nicest day. It is actually very windy, and I can pleasantly report that the Bronco is really not affected that much by the wind. It's uh, and it may be part of it in combination with the uh, with the lane keeping system, but. Overall, it's very stable. I don't get pushed around by the wind very much, which is pretty amazing because, you know, it's shaped like a box. It has all the aerodynamics of a brick. I don't get it, but whatever magic Ford uh, put into the suspension or into the aerodynamics, they did a good job. We're on a bit of four lane now, and we've been able to increase our speed up to 70 miles per hour. The cabin noise has maybe increased just a little bit. And the one thing I noticed is, you know, and again, this is another complaint with the Bronco, is the fact that the standard stereo is not up to par. And I don't think it's actually an issue with the stereo itself. I think it's more of an issue with the resonance of the cabin noise when you get to this speed. I'll turn it up just a little bit so you can hear it. I don't know how well the camera's picking that up. It actually doesn't sound bad. Um, and what we did was, in order to counter the noise, we kind of reconfigured the stereo in the vehicle so the speakers are more driven from the back than they are from the front because obviously they're better speakers, well, bigger speakers anyways. So if you're a true audiophile, I think you'll probably be disappointed in the Bronco. If you're like everybody else, you'll be okay with it and you'll be more distracted by the noise from the hard top. In a lot of these reviews, ergonomics and comfort in the cabin is usually overlooked because the reviewers really don't spend that much time in the vehicles that they are reviewing. So one of the things I've noticed right off the bat with the uh, Bronco here is the fact that the armrest is perfectly positioned where it's comfortable for me. And, you know, I tend to drive with my hand right on the gear shift. Granted, this is not a manual, it's an automatic, but that's just kind of where my hand lands. Again, it's the perfect length. I don't know if they measured me before they built this vehicle or what. The other part is the fact that we have nice big knobs for the radio controls, and for the climate controls, so I don't have to go into the screen and do touch screen stuff while I'm driving. That's really super sweet. Now on the downside, and this is where we get to the screen part, one, there's not the option to go to a full screen and just have CarPlay across the full screen. It'd be nice to have the whole maps, you know. That, that would be just my preference. The other part, mentioning CarPlay, since this vehicle has wireless CarPlay, not exactly in love with it because it's not very good at picking up my phone when I get into the vehicle. If my wife's getting in the vehicle with me, it gets her phone confused with mine. You know, again, it, it just needs to have a bit of work. You know, I'm really happy with, you know, in my GMC, you know, when I have to plug my phone in for the CarPlay there, it's right on the, it's right on the ball with that. When I had a Tesla, and the Tesla, you know, this is two years ago, you know, so you think technology would have advanced even just a little bit. And granted, it wasn't CarPlay, but the Tesla was right on as far as whose phone was operating the car when you're in the driver's seat, as opposed to the other person who was sitting in the passenger seat, even though their phone was logged into the system as well. So Ford, you can work on that a little bit. But I've always said, you know, when you buy a Tesla, you're not buying a car, you're buying technology. When you're buying a Ford, you're getting a little bit of both and they may or may not be what you want it to be. On the subject of technology, so I've had this vehicle for, looks like about 2,600 miles now. And this morning, before I was getting ready to go on this trip, I was notified that I had my first update which I did, it took about 10 minutes. And you know, it's really nice to know 
that Ford's kind of looking out for you and they can actually do those updates uh, as, as they're needed. I want to throw a little bit of kudos to Ford in the respect that on the technology side, the app that they have for remote starting your car, remote unlocking your car, works very well. You can, uh, when you start your car, you can set it for up to 30 minutes. You know, there's there's some other updates that they'll throw you uh, from your vehicle as far as what's happening with your vehicle. But the best part about it is the fact that it's free. GM doesn't do that for me with my Denali. So, again, I really like that about Ford. I like the fact that, you know, there's a lot of things I can learn from my car from the app. But the best part of all is it's absolutely free. At least for now. I think at some point we need to address the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room with this particular vehicle is the fact that this really is just a reincarnated FJ Cruiser and I say that actually as a compliment some people might not think that way probably you know I probably offended all the Ford people all over the place but the reality is people love to compare this vehicle to the Wrangler but the reality is they should be comparing it to the FJ Cruiser. And all you have to do is sit in this thing and drive it once. Take it out on the highway, take it for a drive, and the independent front suspension makes this thing such a pleasure to drive on the road. It's just crazy. And like I said, it's uncanny how this vehicle handles just like the FJ Cruiser. And that's all, all good news. Every Wrangler that I've ever had, and I've owned every generation of Wrangler from the TJ up, the driving was okay, but it wasn't great. And this, I could drive this across the country, I mean, short of the noise from the top, it's pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, there's, there's just little things, and you, you know, we always joke at home about the fact that when they were developing the Bronco, it seemed like they looked at every forum for the past 12-15 years looked at every complaint for the Wrangler and the FJ Cruiser and they did their best to correct them and you can see this you know right in the windshield you know where the windshield is just a little bit taller the wipers cover the entirety of the windshield I mean better than most vehicles period uh, you know there's the blind spot there are less blind spots and the reality is, even if there were blind spots, you've got the, the blind spot indicators and the mirrors, which are awesome. So you'll hear me reference the fact that there's Toyota DNA in this vehicle. And granted, it may be reverse engineered Toyota DNA, but it's here and you can't deny it. To get back on my kick of talking about this being a reincarnated FJ Cruiser, you know, the big elephant in the room obviously is the IFS and like I said that that makes the biggest change in driving but if you look at the rest of the vehicle as a whole there's stuff that the FJ Cruiser pioneered that really Ford and Bronco has carried on part of that being you know the whole idea of heritage I mean this this vehicle it just has a ton of heritage in it a ton of Easter eggs a lot of similarities with the old Bronco and that's really cool and right down to the point where you know where Toyota had the Toyota teams that were promoting the FJ Cruiser and its off-road capabilities so does Ford with the Bronco Rodeo which I did attend in New Hampshire and if you have a Bronco in order you get to go to one of these things for free and you can take a passenger with you. I think it's a, it's like three or four hundred dollars. It's a great experience. I've been off-roading for years, and I've learned a ton of stuff. Just even the most basic, uh, basic points of how to use your Bronco and how to use the particular accessories that go with it. And that said, it's not exactly my forte, so we'll keep going. Similar, you know, more similarities to this and the uh, 
in the FJ Cruiser. Now I'm using my adaptive cruise control. I got a car slowing down in front of me. Oh, I'm gonna let it handle all of it. And are we stopping? And we're gonna go again. God, I love that. I mean, it's not as smooth as doing it yourself, but it's fun that it would take care of it if it had to. Back onto the FJ Cruiser thing. You know, so I, I have the Badlands trim. You know, the washout floors are very cool. Again, that, that was originally a Land Cruiser thing. The um, the fact that it's one of the few vehicles that you can have an available manual, that's very cool. And the fact that, you know, it's, it's a really nice base trim that you can get with this vehicle that's easily uh, updatable uh, or improvable. The fact that there's an excellent base trim of this vehicle is, is really a plus for a lot of people. You know, one of the big complaints in the Wrangler world was the fact that I just want to buy a Rubicon, but I don't want all the stuff to go with it. Well, you know, you can pretty much do that with a Bronco now, right up to the point where you can get a Sasquatch package and have 35s, and all the stuff that goes with the Sasquatch package and have pretty much no other options. That's pretty cool. That is a very cool the, uh, You know, the things you have to consider with Ford is the fact that they also improved the product. They didn't just copy a product, they improved it. And, you know, some of the, you know, the short list is obviously better visibility. The visibility, the blind spots are almost gone, and where there are blind spots, they're covered by blind spot mirrors. So, kudos to Ford for that, although they were probably forced to do a lot of that because of government regulations. Four real doors. You know, the biggest complaint against the FJ Cruiser is probably the fact that it had those little suicide doors and never they never made a real four-door model. The auxiliary switches up top here that are pre-wired, I mean, how, how can you beat that? Someone was listening when we were complaining. And, you know, there's always the wish for more horsepower. And I think the Bronco, you know, the upgraded six-cylinder with the uh, turbos, that is probably one of the greatest power plants out there, and it's really nice to have it. And obviously, all of the tech that goes with this vehicle, I don't know how, how well it will age, but in a new vehicle, it's pretty sweet. Um, you've heard me complaining about the sensors already because every time I wash this car in the wintertime, I've only had it in the wintertime, but every time I wash this car and it's cold out, I get sensor ghosts for days until the car sits in the garage and actually dries, dries out the sensors, I guess. So that's a little complaint, but I'm willing to live with it because so far, I'm really enamored with this truck. SUV, sorry. A little report on the hardtop noise. So now I'm on I-35, I'm traveling at 75 miles per hour, and I'm not heading directly into the headwind. It's actually not bad in here. I'm not catching uh, really a whole lot of obnoxious noise at all. And I think it's probably about half the amount of sound that I was getting with the uh, headwind that I was running into. So maybe the hardtop's not as noisy as people think they are. Maybe it's not as noisy as I made it out to be previous in this trip because it seems pretty good right now. Four hours into driving and casual observation, the seat heaters have three levels and the top level is pretty much unbearable. You will burn your bottom. The steering wheel, on the other hand, pun completely intended, has one level and it's barely noticeable. Kansas City right now, traffic's medium busy. And I have to say, I really, really, really love the adaptive cruise control. The only vehicle I've ever had that had it before was uh, you know, my Tesla, but it was just a little bit sketchy as far as phantom braking here and there. I drove a Tacoma before that had it. It wasn't as good as this. Uh, it was a little bit on the notchy side where this is, it's pure. I like it a lot. While we're on this long drive, there are certain things that you learn to pay attention to attention to detail. And while every automotive journalist pays attention to this, 
there are numerous things around it that are worth paying attention to. First off is the cup holder, which has these little spring-loaded buttons that work perfectly for when you put your drink in it, it doesn't go anywhere. That is just a beautiful thing. And then, coming over here to the window switches, which are basically reversed in orientation, where the furthest one away is actually the front windows and the closest ones are the back windows, which is exactly the way your brain would work in trying to figure that out when you're opening them. Perfect attention to detail. And then the vinyl seats, you know, and I've had vinyl seats before, you know, most recently I had a Tesla which had vegan leather, okay? Vegan leather is vinyl. And it still uses petroleum, so it's kind of disingenuous of Tesla to call it that because it's still a petroleum product. And uh, the one thing to know about this is these are really nice quality seats. The, the vinyl is very thick. It's soft. It doesn't really feel like it's ever going to wear that bad or crack. Again, I like these seats a lot. I like the covering on them. I can't think of a way to improve them. So again, attention to detail is in a lot of places in this vehicle and I can appreciate it. The nation is on the left. Officially, the first leg of the trip is done. We're at about 255 miles, and this is an eco mode. The miles per gallon is 6.1. Pretty disappointing, to be honest. I thought it was gonna be a lot better. I think that tomorrow I'm going to reset the meter, and we'll see what the next leg of the trip holds, and I'll do that on the way back, just to be fair. Good morning. It is a new day. And it'll be five hours on the road today. We're going to see how Eco does. Observation time again. So when I get in the car, put my hand here, and I can't tell you how many times I've pushed the climate control to start the car when the start button is up here. I'll figure it out one of these days. Two observations. So I'm traveling at about 75 miles per hour. When someone calls and you put them on the overhead speakers, you have to crank the volume all the way up. Otherwise, you don't hear them so well. It's a little bit distorted. Also, uh, eco mode's not looking so good today. I'm 106 miles into this leg, and uh, we're getting 14.7 miles a gallon. And that's eco. This is our final mileage from the first leg coming down in Eco. So the official tally is a fairly disappointing 15 miles per gallon for the last 346 miles. And other than the fact that this thing is aerodynamically a brick, it really has no excuse for getting that poor gas mileage. But it is what it is. We'll see what it's like on the way back, but it's not very Eco. So we're on the return leg of the trip right now, and I'm about 40 miles into it on normal mode. We did eco mode going down, as you may remember. And uh, currently, normal mode is blowing eco mode out of the water in the respect that right now I'm at 19 miles a gallon, but it's only been 43 miles. This may change with sustained uh, highway speeds at like 75 miles an hour. I guess we'll find out. The weather itself isn't exactly pleasant. It's spitty and it's rainy. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that the car handles quite nicely in the rain and the windshield wipers handle the rain and clear the windshield very nicely. It's, the, the windshield, the amount that the wipers clear is very impressive so I'm pretty happy with that. As an unhappy observation, Apple CarPlay has proven, or the wireless Apple CarPlay has proven to be less than reliable. Uh, particularly for navigation because you'll be going along and then all of a sudden it will just shut off uh, right when you have a critical turn coming up. So not real happy about that. I'll report more on that, but uh, so far I, I'm pretty much determining that I'm going to try and avoid the wireless function altogether and see if there's one of these ports that I can plug into that will directly take me uh, to 
power play by a wired sense. We'll see how it does then. That's it for now. If you notice, I've got a cable here running from my iPhone down to the USB by the wireless charger because I think that's what directly connects it hardwire to the CarPlay. The issue I've been having is with the phone up here, the CarPlay will just flicker out and lose connectivity and usually it's at a critical time when I'm trying to do some navigation so I'm not real happy about that. Um, I'll test it later, maybe tomorrow, to see if the phone's actually down here if it has better connectivity. But that's a little bit frustrating. So for now, we're just going to run hardwired and see how it does. I'll give you another update soon. Oh my God. It's turning into a disaster. A good disaster. For an end of the day update. And this is the end of leg three, which is the first leg returning home on normal. And as you can see, we are getting 14.4 miles to the gallon. Pretty disappointing. Um, I thought we were gonna do better, uh, but obviously Eco is maybe slightly better than normal. As I start the final leg of this trip, and you know, this will be a total of about 1,400 miles in this Bronco as far as a road trip goes. A lot of it on interstate at 70 plus miles per hour. And that's gonna heavily dictate the following things I'm gonna talk about. And you know, initially when I read reports that you know, people complained of the cabin noise because of the hard top, uh, you know, I thought, well, that's really not that big of a deal. And even when I began the trip, the cabin noise really wasn't that bad, even in the wind. You know, now I must say that this vehicle overall has performed very well in the respect that wind doesn't push it around. The cruise control is amazing. I love the adaptive cruise control. And overall, as an overall picture, the tech makes travel, long travel, uh, very nice. Now that said, the cabin noise. And, you know, if you're traveling for an hour, this cabin noise isn't going to bother you. But when you're talking a four, five, or more hour trip, that's really when it begins to wear on you. And, um, you know, to the point where you can hardly hear people on overhead phone calls. Um, you, it's hard to hear the normal voice on a podcast. And so you're pretty much stuck listening to music because that's the only thing that can come through with the loudness of this. You know, so is that a failure of the top or is that a failure of the stereo? Because I know a lot of people have put in updated stereos and been pretty happy. I think it's a failure of the top. And over this trip, over the course of this trip, I have compared it significantly to how I feel it's a reincarnated FJ Cruiser and better in many ways. But the simple fact is if I had to take a long trip and I had the option of a plain stock FJ Cruiser or a plain stock Bronco I would take the FJ Cruiser just because of the lack of cabin noise and the reality is otherwise the vehicles are very similar as far as mannerisms and you know just the, the overall feel of the vehicle so you know, the Ford fanboys aren't going to be too happy about this, but like I said, I would, I would pick an FJ Cruiser over this for a long trip. But for my daily driving, where I'm doing my daily 60 mile commute, this thing's the bomb. So that's just some final words. We'll have a final note on our eco versus normal. But I just wanted to throw that out while I was thinking about it. and. The traffic's pretty slow, so so is the cabin noise. All right, we'll see you guys in a bit. This is the end of the fourth leg, and admittedly, this is a crazy result, which I can't fully explain. I'll break it all down here shortly.